My name is Don Kurtz. Some of you will have met me before. I am a retired professor of astrophysics at a variety of universities. I'm currently living in the UK, but my wife and I will be primarily retiring back to South Africa to a nice little coastal city called Port Alfred, starting from the beginning of next month, COVID pre permitting. Um, for the person who just signed in from Cape Town, for the rest of you in general, the person in Cape Town will recognize this. That background picture I've put behind me is a picture I took just a year ago right now during the springtime in the west coast of South Africa in an area called Namaqualand, which puts on one of the world's great flower shows. So let me take you to the talk. We'll do a screen share now and I'll bring up the PowerPoint. And tonight I'll talk to you about time. It's about time. And the first question I'd like to ask you is, what is time? Do you know, when you were young, you thought about that and it bothered you a lot. And as we get older, we kind of stop thinking about it. But what really is time? Is time like a river, which Isaac Newton thought, flowing from the past to the future? Is time travel possible? Can you travel to the past? Could you travel to the future with the right kind of science fiction device? Well, if you'd like to imagine being able to travel to the future or the past, then you imagine in some sense the future's out there somewhere and the past is out there somewhere. And maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's only the ever present now. Do you know the next time you're at a party with lots of physicists and astronomers? And does that happen to you? It happens to me. And so one day when it does happen to you and you've got a physicist handy, just say, you know, what is time? See if she can tell you. And well, we'll start talking about entropy and time's arrow and a lot of mathematical stuff, but this is a hard question. So to make it easier, I thought we'll try the dictionary. I went to my dictionary and looked up time and it said time's a measured or measurable duration. And I wasn't very enlightened by that. So I looked up duration and that's a time. So the dictionary doesn't help us. Time's a duration and a duration's a time. This is a very old problem known as the Augustinian dilemma, named after St. Augustine, who wrote in the fifth century when he was thinking about this problem, he said, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know what it is. If I wish to explain what it is to him who asked me, I do not know. And I'm with St. Augustine. This is a really difficult question to answer. And so I'm not going to answer it for you tonight. That's not what the talk's about. Tonight, we're going to look at the measurement of time. And that I do know quite a bit about. The day, the month, and the year have all got astronomical origins. And we'll look more closely at those now. But they may not be quite what you think. The week's got a semi-astronomical origin. And I'll tell you in a little while how the days of the week got their name. Hours, minutes, and seconds are entirely invented by humans. We'll talk about the invention of the hour and why there are 24 hours in the day. Now, this beautiful painting is on the ceiling, the plafond of the council room in the Observatoire de Paris. And it's a painting of the charioteer in mythology with the chariot moving across the sky, pulling the sun behind the charioteer, and the sun moved across the sky because the chariot pulled it across the sky. This particular picture happens to have Venus passing in front of the sun with a little cherub astronomer down here watching. This was to represent the transit of Venus, which is something I could talk to you about in another talk another time. So the day, you know, is the length of time it takes the Earth to rotate on its axis, right? And the answer is not quite. That's not what a day is. So let's look and see what a day really is. We've got two kinds of days. We've got solar days, days by the sun, and sidereal days from the Greek word for stars, days by the stars. And I've drawn a little diagram here, which is schematic. And here's the earth, and that yellow arrow points towards the sun. And so if you were standing where the yellow arrow is or at any latitude along that longitude, it would be noon for this particular picture of the earth. The earth is rotating as we look from the north in a counterclockwise direction. And when the earth rotates once, it also orbits about the sun. And it's not a coincidence that in one day it moves one degree. The Babylonians gave that to us. They liked the number 12. 360 was nicely divided by 12. And they knew how far the sun moved each day. And so they made the degrees to be one degree 
the angle the sun moves through in the sky during the day. You'll notice after one rotation, the Earth's pointing to the stars here, but it's not back to noon. And we like to run our clocks and calendars from noon to noon. And so the Earth has to rotate a little bit further, one more degree. And the solar day is the time from noon till noon the next day. You can see that after three months, with an equal number of rotations of the Earth, we've got to rotate an additional 90 degrees to get back to the sun. And up here at the top, where I didn't draw another diagram, with an equal number of rotations, our arrow to the stars is pointing away, and we'd have to rotate another 180 degrees. By the time we get around the sun, the Earth has to rotate exactly one more time with respect to the stars than it does with respect to the sun. So if you think of the Earth, the calendar having 365 and a quarter days in a year, those are solar days. There are 366 and a quarter sidereal days. That matters to astronomers. We'll stay with the solar days for the calendar. Now the month, it's the length of time it takes the moon to orbit the Earth, right? The year is the length of time it takes the Earth to orbit the sun. And the answer is in both cases, not quite. And we'll come back to those. They're both important for timekeeping. When does a day begin? Midnight is when we traditionally start the day in civil society. And the reason for that is just to keep things simple. We have to change the date at some point during the day and changing it at midnight when most people, this possibly is an older audience where this would apply to you too, you're asleep at midnight. A lot of the younger people are not, but they're usually not doing business. And think how difficult it would be if you're at work, you're doing business and say at noon, you had to change the date right in the middle of the day. Very confusing. So we choose to start the day at midnight. We astronomers work during the night. So here in England, a couple centuries ago, we invented an astronomical day that changes at noon here in England. But of course, elsewhere in the world, when it's noon in England, it's a different time. That hasn't helped us very much as we observe around the world. Some places like Ethiopia, Kenya, which are on the equator, the day doesn't change. The sun comes up at six in the morning, it goes down at six in the evening, and the Ethiopian day starts at sunrise, so does the Swahili day, and runs through till sunset, 12 hours from six in the morning to 12 hours in the evening. If you think of the Jewish Sabbath, the Sabbath starts Friday when the sun goes down, because when that Sabbath first started thousands of years ago, there weren't any good clocks to tell time, but you knew when the sun went down, and in the Middle East, you get to watch that every day. Now, here's a poster from a talk I gave a couple of years ago in Ethiopia when I was lecturing at the Ethiopian Space Science Technology Institute, but at a school for school children. And you'll see that I've circled here. My talk was scheduled from 10 to 11 local time, but the time started at six in the morning. So 10 hours later was really four to 5 p.m. And they put that on the poster for my benefit so I would know when to come. The locals were going 10 to 11 because of the time of day they start just following the sun. I want to talk to you about a physics concept called conservation of angular momentum. Now that sounds complicated. What it means is that spin is conserved. You can transfer spin from one thing to another, but you can't get rid of it. You've got to have what you started with. And here is an ice skater who's about to break the world record for spinning on ice skates. She's going to conserve angular momentum. You'll see her start off with her arms outstretched. The angular momentum is how fast she's spinning, but how far away the mass is from the spin axis. And to spin faster, she will pull her arms in and we'll see her do that. So well, the Earth is spinning and it also has angular momentum and that needs to be conserved. It means the length of the day is not constant. Now we want our clocks to run at a constant rate, but the Earth doesn't spin at a constant rate. The Earth's shape changes with the tides. When we're at first quarter or third quarter moon, as we are tonight, third quarter moon, the moon and the sun are tugging in different directions and the tides are rather small. They're called neap tides. That's a talk I can give you sometime in the future about the tides and all the exciting things we can know about them, both here on the Earth and elsewhere in the universe. And then at full moon and new moon, we get the spring tides when the tides build up very much larger. And that's like the ice skater putting her arms out. The Earth slows down by about one thousandth of a second per day. The Earth rotation also changes with the seasons because the winds blow against the mountains 
and the winds carry angular momentum or spin too. And as the seasons change, the Earth speeds up and slows down. Now, a thousandth of a second may not sound a whole lot to you, but it matters. It matters to us astronomers. It matters in physics. It matters to your GPS and your car. I put El Nino in there because every couple of years, the Pacific Ocean starts to heat and a warm current flows against South America around December 25th, Christmas time. And so the Chileans call that El Nino, meaning the Christ child when you spell it with a capital N. El Nino is just Spanish for the boy child. And when that current flows to the east against the South American continent, it's carrying spin with it. And to keep the spin conserved, the earth slows down. The length of the day changes. And here's a plot starting in the 1960s with time on the bottom, running through up here to 2019, showing the length of the Earth's day. The solid line running along here is the day on our clocks. That's 86,400 seconds. You'll see that for most of the time of the last 50 years, the Earth has been spinning a little bit. The day's been about two thousandths of a second too long, but notice it changes year by year with the seasons. You can see the annual variation and it wiggles up and down. It's not all that regular as time changes and the Earth's spin changes. To keep our clocks aligned with the Earth's spin, we put in what are called leap seconds. We'll come back to that. And this red line showing the leap seconds being added to the calendar over the last 50 years. The moon is used for timekeeping and so I want to talk to you about the moon. This is a real picture. This is not photoshopped. This is a picture from a satellite orbiting out beyond the moon, looking back for Earth observation. And that's a picture of the far side of the moon that we can't see from the Earth. And then the Earth in the background. Notice in this picture, by the way, how dark the moon is compared to the Earth. If I were to ask you what's the color of the moon, you might tell me the moon's gold and the moon's silver. But in fact, the moon's black. It's covered with basaltic lava. It only reflects about 12% of the light that hits it. The Earth is much more reflective with its clouds and its ocean. And so we're very much brighter. And there you can see we're looking down onto a hurricane. It's hurricane season and there's one off of Baja, California. There's California there with the Earth in the background. So the Earth and the Moon interact with each other. There are not only tides in the ocean, there are tides in the land. The Moon causes the land to stretch up as the Moon passes over. Uh, the Earth causes the Moon to stretch as the Earth passes over parts of the Moon. And that stretching causes an interaction between the tides and the spin so that the Earth's rotation is slowing down. The Earth is losing angular momentum. But you can't destroy angular momentum. You can't destroy spin. It has to go somewhere. And where it's going is it's going to the Moon. And that's making the Moon reach out like the ice skater putting her arms out. And so the moon is drifting away from the Earth, which is the way it picks up spin, and the Earth's day is getting longer. Eventually, the day will be over 40 hours long. At present, as the Earth slows down, we add leap seconds to atomic time to keep in step with the solar time, but that plays havoc every time we do it, every year, year and a half, two years. It plays havoc with GPS and a lot of industrial applications of computers, and so there is international discussion to stop putting leap seconds in the calendar and just let the calendar run only on atomic time. Ultimately, if we do that, far into the future, the Earth's spin will be out of step with the clocks. That's happened before, and that's a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight. Putting things into the calendar is called intercalation. Here is a chart showing you the length of the day going back into time, because the moon used to be closer and the Earth used to spin faster. Notice 365 days in a year now with a 24-hour day. If we were to go back to the time of the end of the Cretaceous, when the Triceratops and the um, Tyrannosaurus rex dominated the ecosystems of this planet, there were 370 days in a year, and the day was 23 hours, 23.7 hours long. If we were to go back to when animals first appeared on the land back here in the Silurian 400 million years ago, the day was only 21 hours long, 413 days per year. Now, what would happen to you if we changed the length of the day now to 21 hours? Oh, you know, we just wouldn't be able to handle it physiologically. If the day were only 21 hours long, you'd have to get up three hours earlier every day. So imagine if, if you get up at seven in the morning, usually tomorrow you get up at four, the next day at 1 a.m., the next day at 10 p.m., 
and so on. You, you and I would both get rather ill if we had to do that. But of course, with evolution, things adapt slowly. Now, the oldest land animal currently known is from about 425 million years ago. There's a artist's impression by making a model. It was a millipede. It's from the Silurian back when the day was only 21 hours long. The real thing, there's the fossil there. Uh, the artists and the scientists are pretty good at reproducing this from that. But these are the amongst the first land animals to appear here on Earth when the day was very, very much shorter. Ours come to us from the Babylonians. Now, the Babylonians get a lot of bad press nowadays in the news. They are the Iraqis, of course, but they've got a very illustrious history, a very illustrious um, archaeology there. And the Babylonians decided 3,500 years ago to divide days and nights into 12 hours each. Again, 12 was a number they liked to count with. It's actually a superior way to count than counting to 10 like we do. And the reason is that 12 divides nicely if you're dividing things up. It's why we buy eggs by the dozen, donuts by the dozen. You can divide 12 by 2, 3, 4, 6, and get an even number. 10 you can only divide by 2 and 5. So they actually had a better system. Too bad we don't have a base 12 system. We've got base 10, which is okay, but not as good. And they had 12 hour days and 12 hour nights, but they didn't have any clock to measure the, the passage of time. And so their hours stretched. And in the summertime when the days were long, there were 12 long hours during the day and 12 short hours at night and vice versa. The fixed length hour didn't appear until Europeans invented uh, accurate mechanical clocks uh, in about the 1400s. And for those of you who've been to Prague in the Czech Republic, that beautiful clock on the town square there dates from about that period. Most societies have chosen to have weeks. The weeks arbitrarily are grouped basically between five and 10 days per week by various people. The Dogon people in Mali and North Africa still operate off of a five day week. Early Romans had an eight day week. It's probable that our international seven day week predates the writing of the Old Testament. I'll tell you why in just a moment. Why do people have weeks? And the answer is until recently, most people were rural. We're now an urban world with most people living in cities. But when you live in a rural environment, you've got a small village, a cluster of people, a few families. You need to gather regularly, primarily for reasons of social reasons, this is not social distancing, but socially getting close when times are okay for it. And for market and of course for religious purposes. So the week is a highly desirable part of the calendar. Why does our week, why does the international week have seven days? This is now speculation, but it's plausible. We think that this is the reason. It's because of the number of planets. But I've put quotes around that word planets. Planets in this sense means anything in the sky that moves through the stars which appear to be fixed over a human time scale. That means the things you and I call planets, but also the sun and the moon. And the Babylonians ordered the planets in terms of how long they took to move through the stars. Because the Babylonians asked themselves, why do the planets move through the stars? And they came up with an answer to that. The answer is the planets are gods and they move through the stars because they want to. That is, of course, where astrology came from, too, imagining the planets were gods and somehow the gods had an effect first on the king and then later on other people's lives. Uh, we know the planets aren't gods now, but for the Babylonians, the most powerful god, of course, is the one who moves most slowly, and for them, that was the planet Saturn. That was the king of the gods. Well, in mythology, Saturn didn't start as the king of the gods. He usurped his father, Uranus, who later got to be a planet, but not in the time of the Babylonians. And Saturn's the most powerful god. It takes 30 years to move around through the stars because it takes 30 years to orbit the sun. Jupiter then, Saturn's sun, the next most powerful god, 12 years to go around the sun. Mars, 1.9 years. The sun moves through the sky. You'll notice the earth isn't in here. They didn't know the earth was a planet. These are just lights in the sky. But the sun takes a year to move around the sky because that's the earth moving around the sun. And then Venus, Mercury, and the moon moving faster. The Babylonians were highly religious and they gave every hour of every day over to one of their gods. Now, you may have been wondering yourself, well, isn't Jupiter the king of the gods? Isn't Jove the king, Zeus? And the answer is later, yes. These two horrendous paintings are by Goya. They're in the Prado, the great art museum in Madrid in Spain of 
Saturn eating his children. And he managed to eat all of them except Jupiter in some versions of the story, even Jupiter and others. His wife, of course, Rhea, was not happy with that. And in some stories, she makes him ill and up come the children. He did that because he had had a prophecy that Jupiter would usurp him as he had usurped his father. And of course, when Jupiter came back up again, he was very unhappy and he did usurp his father and become king of the gods. But to the Babylonians, Saturn was the king. And so the first day of the first week belonged to Saturn, and that was Saturn's day. The second hour to Jupiter, third to Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, and the Moon. And then the eighth hour went back to Saturn, down through the list, 15th to Saturn, down through the list, until after 24 hours, the first hour of the next day belonged to the Sun. And so, so following Saturn's day was Sun's day. And then down through the list again, following Sun's day was Moon's day. I think this is sounding familiar to you, Saturn's day, Sun's day, Moon's day. It's 3,500 years old. But keep skipping three at a time. After Moon's day, one, two, one, two, three, we get Mars's day, Mercury's day, Jupiter's day, and Venus's day. Well, Saturn's day, Sun's day, and Moon's day sounds fine, but Mars's day, Mercury's day, Jupiter's day, Venus's day, where did they come from? Well, for those of you who speak any of the Romance languages, just think about it, and you'll see the weekend days have been turned over to things like Sabado, Sabbath, or Domingo, Lord's Day in Spanish, Samedi and Dimanche in French. But look at the weekdays in French, Lundi, Mardi, Mercredi, Jeudi, Vendredi, or in Spanish, Lunes, Martes, Mercoles, Jueves, Viernes. You can see the Moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, and Venus. What happened in English? Well, up here where I live in the north of England, Hagar the Horrible, the Vikings came and they stayed. They interbred, they remained and some of their language and some of their gods came too. And for the Vikings in Norse, Mars was two, Mercury was Woden, Jupiter was Thor and Venus was Freya. Hence this pattern for the Babylonians became Saturn's day, Sun's day, Moon's day, Tuesday, Woden's day, Thor's day and Freya's day. It's a cute little story, I hope you remember it. You can tell your friends over a drink sometime. Uh, most people are amused by that. Now, I'm moving back to South Africa. I lived there for 24 years. Um, besides being an emeritus professor here at my university in Preston in the UK, I also now am an extraordinary professor at the Northwest University, a historically black university in the Northwest province of South Africa. Uh, I've got some visiting professorships elsewhere too. They keep me very busy. But I wanna to talk to you about South Africa a little bit partly because I love it, and also because I want to talk to you about the moon and timekeeping by the moon. And um, believe it or not, this particular scene of a very famous battle in British colonial history will lead us to the moon. This is an artist painting of the Battle of East San Juana in Zululand. It was the 22nd of January, 1879. The British government had signed treaties with the king of the Zulus, whose name was Echwayo, uh, but they broke the treaty. And for those of you who are paying attention to UK news, you'll realize that the British government's quite capable of signing an international treaty and then breaking the word on it. They've done it again today. Leaving that alone, let's go back to East San Juana. The British had made treaties with Thetchwayo, but they had broken them and he had finally had enough. On the morning of the 22nd of January, 1879, it's the middle of summer in South Africa, it's Southern Hemisphere. The sun rose, the guards for Nearly 1,700 British soldiers camped at the base of that mountain you see in the background were not watching carefully. Lord Chelmsford thought that the British soldiers were immune. He had put up no defenses, no walls. He had dug no trenches. And 8,000 Zulus came over the horizon that morning. The battle raged the entire day. The British army was wiped out. About 2,000 Zulus died too. There were a few survivors amongst the British army and they ran down the mountain behind where you're looking in this picture to the Buffalo River. Now I've walked that path on this summer's day in the middle of summer in the incredible heat with a brilliant raconteur storyteller who lived for the Zulu war stories. His name was David Rattray. And he told us the stories as we walked that path where these soldiers had run down to the river. They got to the river, which was in flood. Two of the lieutenants in English, lieutenants here, sorry, lieutenants in English, lieutenants to you Americans who are listening. Lieutenant Melville, Lieutenant Coghill were trying to save the Queen's colors for the honor of the regiment. 
and swimming the river. One of them was swept away with the colors, which was lost. They both did manage to swim ashore, but the Zulus who were chasing them simply shouted across the flood to some Zulus on the other side who weren't part of the battle, you better kill those two men, we know where you live, and if you don't get them when this river goes down, we're coming after you. So Melville and Coghill were killed at that point. There's a memorial to them there. And many years later, um, they were both given a Victoria Cross, that is the highest British honor for military valor. And they were the first two and amongst the first two recipients. The battle continued at Rourke's Drift through the night, very famous battle in British military history. When I was walking with David Rattray on that, he said to me he had heard from an old Zulu man who he had listened to stories about the battle. David was my age, I'm 71 now, and he had sat as a boy in the huts of the Zulus who had fought in that battle. He was fluent in Zulu and he had heard their stories, and they told him there was an eclipse of the sun during the battle. Uh, the few British survivors didn't mention that, but here's a map I looked up for him. There was an eclipse that day. It started in the morning off of South America here, came across the Atlantic Ocean, that's the noon point, and then it swept across Namibia, Botswana, Zambia, up through Tanzania for the central part. Down here in Zululand, it was about a 55% eclipse. And so about half the sun was blocked out, and that's a bit like it being cloudy. It's not surprising, fighting for your life, you might not notice, but the Zulus noticed. There was somebody else who heard about it, a man named Ryder Haggard. Haggard is famous author in British history. There from the British Library is an original manuscript of his book, King Solomon's Mind, showing the map. Writer Haggard's stories are no longer politically correct. He was, of course, a man of imperial times. Um, I still find his books uh, thrilling to read, reading them, if you like, as a boy's own story. In King Solomon's Minds, the heroes make their way north. I picture from reading the book that they've actually worked their way up to Tanzania. When they're captured by local people, they're to be executed in the morning, but the hero of the story predicts a total eclipse of the sun, which happens, and the locals are so amazed they're released, they survive because of that. And Haggard put that in that story because of this eclipse during the Battle of Isandwana. Haggard didn't really understand how the moon and the sun move. Now, if you haven't read writer Haggard, you probably know him from the movies because Hollywood has a lot that it owes to writer Haggard. If you read Alan Quatermain, She Who Must Be Obeyed, uh, in those stories you'll find boats going down through caves into mountains to come out on the other side and magical places with volcanoes going off inside the cave. And in She, somebody who's thousands of years old when finally the magic disappears and she turns to dust and then bones in a matter of seconds, they're right out of the Indiana Jones movies. So Ryder Haggard wrote the original scripts for Indiana Jones, but he didn't know his astronomy. In King Solomon's Minds, he originally wrote on June 2nd after sundown. In the east, there's a glow, then a bent edge of silver light, and at last the full moon, bow of the crescent moon peeps above the plain. And folks, not here on planet Earth and not on any planet in the universe can that happen. If the moon is rising when the sun's setting, the sun's going down in the west, the moon's coming up in the east, and the sun is shining right on the face of the moon you're looking at. Full moon rises at sunset. The crescent moon is seen way low in the west just after sunset, early in the cycle of the moon, or way low in the east just before sunrise, late in the moon cycle. The full moon rises as the sun sets. So that was ridiculous. But then the next night in this book, he had a full moon. So the moon has gone from, I'll put it over here with my arrow, in the east, it's a crescent, he's got it in the wrong place, and by the next night, it's leaped all the way across the sky, and it's a full moon, but full moon comes up at sunset. And sunset in South Africa is kind of around 6, 6 p.m. in Zululand. He's got the moon coming up four hours late. And then the next day, he had his total eclipse. And the total eclipse occurs at new moon, two weeks after full moon. So he's got the moon flying all over the sky. He really should have taken my introductory astronomy course before he became a famous author. And astronomers ridiculed this so much that he actually in later editions patched it up. He's not the only one. Other authors do that. We'll stay one in the past here. Edgar Allan Poe, for you Americans listening in. In his story, Descent into the Maelstrom, he's got a ship sailing into the storm off the Norwegian coast at a latitude of 68 degrees north on July the 10th. And as the ship approaches the storm, the captain reads the time on his watch by the light of the full moon, which is near the zenith. That's impossible that far north. 
for the moon to be at the zenith. But even more so, I took a picture at, 20, at 68 degrees north on July 8th, a few years ago, when I was there on a ship. And this is midnight, the sun was up. I have no idea why Poe had his captain reading his watch by the light of the full moon when the sun is up. It's above the Arctic Circle. It's, that picture is taken very close to where we go when we go on our um, Aurora trip with Golden Eagle up to Kirkenes in Norway. This is North Cape, not far from that. So some authors who do know what's happening in the sky, if you read Thomas Hardy, go back to read Far From the Madding Crowd, think about it, or you can imagine the movie posters I put in here from the movie version where Farmer Gabriel Oak at the beginning of the story comes out late at night. There's a commotion and his sheep dog has driven his sheep off the cliff, destroyed his flock of sheep, and of course setting in motion a lot of the tragedy of the story. But during that description, Hardy is describing the sky. He's describing the constellation Orion. Hardy knew his stars. Some authors do, some don't. I'm amused regularly when I'm reading fiction or other stories by modern authors when they've got the moon doing impossible things. But societies use the moon to keep time. And that is really awkward. The moon orbits the earth in 27.32 days. That's not a month because in the time it takes the moon to orbit the earth, the earth orbits the sun. And so just like with the sidereal day and the solar day, for the moon to go from new moon to new moon or back full moon to full moon, it has to go farther than just once around the earth. It's got to catch up that bit the earth orbit of the sun and so the month, as we call it, the phases of the moon, has a length of 29.53 days. There are 12.37 months in a year, and that's an awkward way to keep time. But some calendars did, and some calendars do. The Jewish calendar is entirely lunar. The months are 29.53 days long on average. But a Greek astronomer named Meton discovered a couple thousand years ago that in 19 years, there are virtually exactly 238 months, 235 months, excuse me. 235 months equals 18.99999 years. And so with the Jewish calendar, the months are exactly lunar. They go with the phases of the moon. But some years have 13 months and some years have 12 months. And in a 19-year cycle, there are 12 years with 12 months and seven years with 13 months, and it all comes back together again after 19 years. That's the reason why Jewish New Year moves around in September, if any of you pay attention to that, or if you're Jewish, you'll know that because it matters to you. The current Hindu calendar is also lunisolar. The months are lunar, but to correct for this problem of the uh, year being too short that way, the Hindu calendar adds an extra, uh, extra month er, about every two and a half years, and you'll notice the Jewish calendar has seven years they do that too. If we multiply seven times two and a half, that's 14, 17 and a half years. This comes very close to the Metonic cycle and they adjust it as necessary. The Muslim calendar still in use is entirely lunar worldwide. And it has months of 29 and 30 days to get an average of 29 and a half. That 0.03 of a day builds up after 30 months, there's an extra day. So in the Muslim calendar, every two and a half years, there has to be a leap day. That is why Ramadan, the ninth month, when the um, Muslims go on Hajj, if they're to go to Mecca once in their life, and they fast over Ramadan, or sorry, Dulhijah when they go to Mecca, Ramadan when they fast. If you're not Muslim yourself, it surprises you when those come because th those months move through the calendar we use by nearly 11 days per year. So the month isn't quite what you thought perhaps, and the earth isn't either. The Earth orbits the Sun in 365.2564 days, a little bit more than 365 and a quarter. But that's not what we build our calendar on. The Earth is spinning like a top. And remember, when you played with tops when you were a kid, or if you still do now, I still have some that are fun to play with. If you tip them and spin, they will wobble. That's called precession. And the Earth is tipped 23 and a half degrees to its orbit about the Sun. The gravity of the sun and the moon tugging on the earth cause it to precess with a period of 25,800 years. That shortens the year from the beginning of spring to beginning of spring to 365.2422, not quite 365 and a quarter. And you think, oh, the difference is insignificant. Uh, we're going to find out historically it's not insignificant. This is what 
the world has tried to build its now international calendar on for 2000 years. Let's go back to the beginnings of that, to the Roman Republican calendar. This is pre-empire. We're going back 700 years BC. The Roman Republican calendar had only 10 months in it. And those months, of course, were for the moon to go around um, through its cycle. There was a two month gap in winter and eventually some bright spark realized, well, the moon's still going around, we should name those months. And so they were named, but they were added to the end of the year. The Roman Republican calendar started in Martius. We call it March. The first day of the year was March the 25th in the Republican calendar. You think why that odd day? That was the start of spring. That was the start of the spring equinox. And you're saying to yourself right now, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, the spring equinox, the start of spring is on March 21st, sometimes 22nd, not the 25th. Well, we'll get to that. We'll see why. And so the Roman months were Martius, Opralis, Maius, Unius. You'll recognize those as March, April, May, and June. And then 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th months in Latin, Quintilis, Sextilis, September, October, November, December. And then the two months added to the end of the year were Januarius and Februarius. And to keep the months at 29 and a half days on average with this variation here, poor old February got shortchanged as it still is. The year was too short by 10 and a half days. It was entirely lunar. And so the way the Romans took care of that is an extra month was intercalated, shoved into the calendar about every three years. And it was put in after February the 23rd. And then after that extra month, they went back and had the last five days of February. What? If you're still working, if you're not retired like me, and you're working and you care about the calendar, if, if you happen to, if you're an academic like me and you care about the academic calendar, business, whatever, what would happen to you if next year at the end of February 23rd, we decided to have an extra month and then go back to February? It would be very confusing. This is difficult. We don't know why they did it after February 23rd. Eventually it got shoved to the end of the month and that's why leap day comes at the end of February, not perhaps the most convenient place to have it in the calendar, but it dates back this nearly 2,700 years to the Roman Republican calendar. The Romans had March the 25th as the start of the year and then later in England, which of course the Romans colonized for 400 years and then England's colonies and that's, I'm now including at least the East Coast of North America, the original American colonies. March the 25th was the beginning of the year until 1752. We'll come back to that too. In the Roman Empire, as you traveled about, you could travel not just from place to place, but from time to time, even year to year, because local rulers didn't have fast communication. There was no internet. They certainly couldn't do a Zoom like we're doing now. And if you've got a tax year ending and you need to collect the taxes, but it's a year you want to add a, a month to the calendar and you, your coffers are empty and you're the ruler, you decide, all right, I'm not going to have that extra month and make everybody pay up. And so it varied from place to place. It got very confusing. Different parts of the Roman Empire were actually on different time. The months were entirely lunar, as I mentioned. The first day of the month was called New Moon. And those first days of the month were known as calendi. We still have this word calends in English. But calendi is the root source of our word calendar, as we use for keeping time. Now, there's a painting of a famous scene you'll know from Shakespeare's version of Julius Caesar, probably from watching the play, possibly from reading it too. And there are the conspirators led by Brutus who are assassinating Julius Caesar on the Ides of March. And the soothsayer has warned Caesar, beware the Ides of March. Uh, the Romans had a terribly difficult timekeeping system. They kept dates with respect to the Ides, which fell around full moon, either on the 15th or the 13th of the month, or with respect to the knowns, which fell either on the 7th or 5th of the month, depending on the month, or from the calends. The second day, the knowns, the Ides were all inauspicious. They were unlucky days. And so the soothsayers always told everybody, beware the Ides of March. And of course, if the soothsayer is a good prognosticator, he would have some idea there was dissatisfaction, there were problems, and that an assassination was possible. So it's believable that the soothsayer, without being able to see the future, would have, wrong, would have warned Caesar, beware the Ides of March. If you look at dates at Roman times, you will not find that something was on the 13th of March. It won't be dated that way. It will be dated two days before the Ides. 
or if it was on the 11th, it might be dated as two days after the knowns. So keeping track of how much time has gone by, looking at old Roman documents, it's a real calculation. If you think that's bad, think back to when you learned Roman numerals and imagine trying to do mathematics with Roman numerals. Try multiplying two Roman numerals together. Now, there's a good reason why those Arabic or Indian numerals that we use in mathematics came about. So the Julian calendar started at the start of spring. That's when the days are equal and they're getting longer in the Northern Hemisphere. Day and night are equal. That's called the vernal equinox. And by 46 BC, the Republican calendar had drifted by three months from the equinox. Well, Caesar decided to get that fixed. The Julius Caesar, that is. And he hired an Alexandrian astronomer. Now, uh, Sosigenes was of Greek descent, but living in Alexandria in North Egypt. And he was hired to revise the calendar for Caesar. On the left of your picture there, I've got a picture of a bust of Julius Caesar. Those are all over the Roman Empire. Caesar's got busts everywhere. On the right is a crater on the moon. It's about 17 kilometers, a little over 10 miles across. And we astronomers named that after Sosigenes. So there's crater Sosigenes. That's his memorial given to him by us astronomers. And well, in my opinion, the greater memorial is the unique one on the right, the memorial to Sosigenes. And he decided the year would have 365 days. And then every fourth year, we'd have an extra day. At that time, they put it between February 23rd and 24th, the traditional place. It eventually went to the end of February. And he also said that January 1st would be the beginning of the year. That didn't stick. The government said you will start the year on January the 1st and the people just ignored the law and they continued to start the year on March the 25th. And that remained so, as I said, in England until 1752 and other parts in Europe a bit earlier, we'll come to that. The length of the month was alternating 30 or 31 days, except for poor old February who got shortchanged. And so if you remember from childhood, that little rhyme, 30 days, half September, April, June, and November, I'm about to tell you why. Tiberius was a terrible emperor. That's a picture I took of his platform on the beautiful island of Capri. Um, Tiberius had a little bit of trouble counting to four, and so he had leap years every three. Not quite as dumb as it yet sounds. Uh, it's the problem of zero and whether zero is a number, and that still causes a lot of confusion. If I ask you, what year was your first birthday? The answer is your first birthday is the day you were born. That's why it's called a birthday. One year later, you say you're one, and so really your first birthday you call zero. Your second birthday you call one, your third birthday you call two, your fourth birthday you call three, and there's where Tiberius's confusion came in. And so they had the leap year a little too soon. They needed to wait till the end of that year. Claudius, very much better emperor, fixed that up later. 46 BC, to get the vernal equinox back where it needed to be, there was an extra three months, 455 days. And not surprisingly, that was known as the year of confusion. If we had an extra three months this year or next year, it would cause a lot of confusion for us too. Imagine throwing an extra three months into the calendar now. Those of you sitting there in America, you and we, I still vote in the US, I vote in Florida, by the way. Um, we've got a, an election coming in November. If we threw in an extra three months now, uh, some of the politicians would like that, some wouldn't, but it would definitely cause confusion. So I say here, the Romans learned their ABCs. I'm calling the Julian calendar beginning on the year 45 BC, January 1st, but the Romans didn't call that BC. C hadn't happened yet. They didn't know they were B. They counted their years from the founding of Rome fictitiously by Romulus and Remus, who being orphaned were suckled by a she-wolf. This is the famous statue on the Capitoline Hill in Rome. And they dated their time from about 750 BC from the founding of Rome by Romulus and Remus. So July, August, and September. After Caesar's death, the fifth month was renamed after him. He was a great emperor, and so Quintilus became Julius. It has 31 days naturally. Later, when Augustus died, they decided to name Sextilus the sixth month after him, so it became Augustus. But it originally had 30 days, and they gave it 31 because you can't shortchange Augustus if Julius has got 31 days. And then Caligula, who was a disastrously bad emperor, um, we have bad rulers in various parts of the world now, but none of them is quite as bad as Caligula at the moment. Caligula was absolutely terrible. 
and he wanted to rename September Germanicus after his father, the great Roman general who subdued the Huns in the north to protect the Roman Empire, and the people wouldn't do it. And that was because it was widely believed at that time. And if you read Robert Graves' history of the time, um, and he is a good historian as well as writes very good uh, books about the history, it's thought that Caligula and his mother poisoned Germanicus and killed him. And so that didn't stick, which is why we've got July, August, September, not July, August, Germanicus in our calendar. There's the reason for 30 days, half September, etc. In the Roman calendar, it started in March, and the months were just 3130, 3130, and so on, except for well, February. Then when the first of the year was pushed to January, March comes down here, 3130, 3130. Julius has got 31, and now Augustus should be 30, as it used to be when it was sextilis, but that was given an extra day. That got stolen from poor old February, and then they went back to alternating, and there's your 30 days, half September, April, June, and November. Take it back more than 2,000 years. Time flies. It looks like the calendar is under control, but the length of the year is a little bit short of 365 and a quarter. 11 minutes and 14 seconds per year is missing. And by the year 325 AD, that had added up to more than three days. That pushed the vernal equinox from the 25th of March to the 21st of March, where it still is. Depending on whether we have a leap year or not, sometimes it's 22nd of March, but that's how it got pulled forward. Why did it stay there? And the answer is because of the Council of Nicaea. Who's worried about the start of spring? And the answer is not the farmers. Farmers understand the weather. Farmers understand when to plant based on the weather. And with the year being too short by 11 minutes and 14 seconds, the date of the calendar drifts so slowly, it's not going to confuse the farmers. The people who want to fix the dates in the calendar are the priests, particularly here, the priests of the church, the Christian church. And they wanted to set primarily the date of Easter, the second most important holiday in the Christian calendar. They met in a part of Turkey still known as Nicaea. The town itself that's there now, the city's called Iznik, and Iznik is absolutely famous for its beautiful, beautiful tiles, uh, particularly in the old mosque, but also you can buy the tiles there if you go to Turkey, lovely place to visit. That's an Iznik tile in the background of this. But if you wondered, why does Easter move around so much? What's the rule for Easter? Here it is. The Council of Nicaea in the year 325 set the date of Easter to be the first Sunday following essentially the full moon, 14th day of the moon. This is called the ecclesiastical full moon. Following the 21st of March, which is the ecclesiastical vernal equinox. So even in years when astronomy says the vernal equinox is on the 22nd, ecclesiastically for the church, it's on the 21st. And so Easter is on the first Sunday following the full moon, following the vernal equinox. That was intended to be after the first day of Passover, um, because as you know, uh, all religions don't necessarily get along with each other, and they like to do things their own way. But they didn't do anything about the length of the year. It's still too long. And so by 1582, the vernal equinox had moved to the 11th of March. Pope Sixtus IV invited a German astronomer named Johann Müller, who was known by a Latin name Regio Montanus, to come to Rome to reform the Julian calendar, and he was assassinated trying to reform the calendar. Why would anybody assassinate an astronomer who's just trying to fix the calendar? And the answer is, uh, think about this in terms of, say, Catholicism. Some of you are quite possibly Catholic, and I don't mean this in any bad way, but I picture the Catholic religion as being highly polytheistic. And the reason I say that is it has hundreds and hundreds of saints who, if you pray to them, can possibly intercede in your life with supernatural powers. Now, if your saint you have a saint and it's your saint's day and you're praying to your saint and somebody changes the calendar, does the saint know if it's the right day or not? Will that saint be listening to you? It's that kind of argument that led to the assassination of Muller. And that put an end to the reform of the calendar in 1476. It had to wait more than a century. You know this Pope Sixtus? Well, if you say no, as I asked that, I think the answer is yes, you do because one of the famous things Sixtus did during his life was to renovate the Sistine Chapel. Now this was in the 1480s and a generation later, 30 years after he renovated the Sistine Chapel, the next Pope 
um, was the patron of Michelangelo, who painted, of course, this very famous ceiling in the Sistine Chapel. For those of you who've been to Rome, you've been in St. Peter's, you've been to the Sistine Chapel. For those of you who haven't, you're going to go or you'll return again. Next time you go, I would like you to go into St. Peter's and wander down the right-hand nave until you come to the Chapel of Gregory the 13th. I'll show you where it is in the next slide. Gregory the 13th was the Pope who had the calendar reform that we use today. We call it the Gregorian calendar after him. And here in his chapel in St. Peter's is this beautiful relief of Gregory sitting there with his learned men. I'm sorry, ladies, it was only men then. We in astronomy are very changed from that now with their books, their globe of the earth, spyglass here for the reform of the calendar. Here's a map of St. Peter's. And if you come in and you come up here to the end of the church, looking down the nave to the altar, most people rush right over here to the right to number three because that's where Michelangelo's Pieta is and the crowds there are just massive. If you can't take those crowds, come down this right-hand nave right here and tuck yourself into this chapel number eight. That's where the Gregorian chapel is where I took that picture. So as the patron Gregorian, he had two astronomers reform the calendar, Luigi Lilio Giraldi, who died in 1576 of natural causes, and then Christopher Clavius, who completed the work. And the problem is the Julian calendar has one day too many in 128 years. The Gregorian calendar fixes that by making century years common years. That is, they're not leap years. Every four years a leap year, but not if it's divisible by 100, except if it's divisible by 400. Oh, how confusing. All right, 1700, 1800, and 1900 were not leap years. They were century years. But the year 2000, which is divisible by 400, was a leap year. 2100, 22, 2300 won't be, 2400 will be. And that fixes the calendar a lot. It's getting very close. Clavius was famous, and Arthur Clarke, the famous science fiction author, decided to honor him by putting a bit of Clavius's memorial into a story which he called The Sentinel, later became 2001 A Space Odyssey from back in the 1960s. In that story, Arthur Clarke put the monolith of the story which was placed there by aliens in the story, uh, in the crater Clavius, which we astronomers have done to honor Christopher Clavius on the moon. And so there's an outtake from Stanley Kubrick's movie, and nobody had been to the moon at that point, but there they're imagining what the Earth would look like from the moon, and you know it's not bad. Their imaginations were good. We of course have been there now. This is a real picture. This is from a Japanese satellite that's orbiting the moon, and there's a picture of Earth rise over the moon Beautiful picture. Of course, when the first Apollo astronauts orbited the moon and saw that, it really changed our view of planet Earth. So the vernal equinox, to get it back in place, the Gregorian calendar shifted it by taking 11 days out of the calendar. The 5th of October, or 10 days out, the 5th of October was followed by the 15th of October. But this is now 1582. The edict was followed in Catholic countries, but the Protestants aren't going to do what the Pope says because this is post Martin Luther and this is post Henry VIII here in England. And so England and the colonies didn't make the change until 1752, by which time the calendar was 11 days off. And Parliament finally decreed 2nd of September 1752 was to be followed by the 14th. 1752 in England, in the UK, in the American colonies, started on March the 25th, and then 1753 started on January the 1st. There never was a January or February or March 1st to 20, 24th in the year 1752. They don't exist. Historians call keeping time and giving dates by the Julian calendar old style. They'll, they'll mark that as OS by the Gregorian calendar, NS for new style. There are myths that here in England there were time riots. Supposedly, when the 11 days were pulled out of the calendar, the workers wanted a full month's pay and employers refused. Landlords wanted a full month's rent, tenants refused. This is a myth. It didn't actually happen, but you know, it's not completely implausible. I was an undergraduate in San Diego back in the 1960s. And when San Diego, California would go on summertime, daylight savings time, every year in the astronomy department while I was an undergraduate, the same woman would call us up 
and complained bitterly that the extra hour of sunlight was destroying her lawn and wilting her flowers. Well, folks, I assure you, we astronomers can mess around with the clock, but we can't change the length of the day. But you can see that this kind of confusion might occur. Workers weren't paid by the month then, they were paid by the week. Landlords uh, collected rent by the week. That still happens some here in England. You can pay rent by the week. What really happened was it came from a joke by a famous painter named William Hogarth. This painting is in one of the world's most wonderful eclectic little museums called the Sir John Soane's Museum. It's on Lincoln's Inn Fields in London. And if you've not been there, I can't recommend it more highly. Sir John Soane's was the architect who uh, designed the Bank of England, many other important buildings in the city of London. And he was a wealthy man. He has a beautiful house on Lincoln's Inn Fields. And he filled it with antiquities, with art, with interesting architectural features. And when he died, he bequeathed it in perpetuity as a permanent museum that is free for anybody to enter. Of course, you'll be asked for a donation. It's well worth supporting. And he said that it wasn't to be changed, and it hardly has been. It's pretty much as he left it. William Hogarth had made some very large paintings. These are the size of a wall. To see them all, you have to time when you go in for when the curator is opening the paintings, folding them out so you can see them. One of the ones in the back is this picture of the people having a riot and getting drunk. Uh, there's a man in the back there with a chair. It looks like he's about to smash the window. This man's passed out drunk, completely comatose. This one in the front has collapsed on the floor in his drunkenness, and that man's pouring a wine a jug of wine over his head. You can see they're partying, there's music. This is all because supposedly of the 11 days lost on their life. Well, there's a poster underneath this man's foot down here. The resolution's not high enough for you to read it in this picture that I've got, but it says, give us our 11 days. And that's the source of the story of the English time riots. Excuse me. Now, in England, tax day, the tax year starts on April the 6th. And for those of you who are British, you might have wondered, well, why April 6th? For those of you who are American, it's simply in America, you shifted it to the middle of the month to rationalize this a bit. Well, March the 25th was the beginning of the tax year until 1752. And then with 11 days being pulled out of the calendar, count them here, 11 days pulled out, the beginning of the year, if you go exactly one year later, shifts to April the 6th. And what happened was when March the 25th came around in 1753, the government in England said to the bankers, pay your taxes. The bankers said, no, it's not been a year since you last collected. You wait until a year has elapsed. And with the bankers and the government having a stare down, the government blinked first. Um, what's changed? So the bankers got their way, the tax date was shifted to April the 6th. In the colonies in North America, it was rationalized at least to the middle of the month. Benjamin Franklin, who of course is a nice, well, his house is still in London, um, not far from Trafalgar Square. And Benjamin Franklin wrote in Poor Richard's Almanac, amongst his other clever things, be not astonished nor look with scorn, dear reader, at such a deduction of days, nor regret us for the loss of so much time. But take this for your consolation, that your expenses will appear lighter and your mind be more at ease. And what an indulgence is here for those who love their pillow, to lie down in peace on the second of this month and not perhaps awake until the morning of the 14th. On the island of Jura in Scotland, there is a gravestone, which is on the left there. It's hard for you to read, and so I've written it on the right. It says, Mary McCrane died in 1856, aged 128, descendant of Giller McCrane, who kept 180 Christmases in his own house and who died in the reign of Charles I. And we know this is ridiculous. People don't live to 180, and nobody's ever at least officially lived to 128. What's happening here? Well, Giller McCrane was celebrating Christmas on both Julian Christmas and Gregorian Christmas. They differ. And in Russia, where we go with Golden Eagle, the Russian Orthodox Church still celebrates Christmas on the Julian calendar. And so here's an explanation of why the Russian Orthodox Christmas is on the 7th of January. I put this together a couple of years ago off of some calendars on the web. There was Christmas Day, and there are the 13 days that have now built up difference between the Julian and the Gregorian calendar. 
And so the Russian Orthodox Church is on the Julian calendar and Christmas comes on Saturday, on Sunday, the 7th of January in that case, always on the 7th of January. For those of you who do the uh, trip to the Northern Lights with Golden Eagle, which takes in New Year along the way as you come out of St. Petersburg or out of Moscow, and then you actually get to celebrate Russian Orthodox Christmas and Russian New Year too. The Russians in 1908 came to the Olympics in London. The 1908 Olympics were supposed to be in Rome, but Mount Vesuvius erupted. And yes, I know Vesuvius is not Rome, it's in Naples, but the economic impact was such that the Italians didn't feel they could put on the Olympics. And so London took it. The Olympics were in London and some of the Russian team, particularly some of the shooters missed the Olympics. And the reason is they went on the correct date, but they went on the Julian calendar and they were 13 days too late. This is a picture of beautiful embroidery done long time ago, which I took in the museum in the city of Petrozavodsk, which we visit with Golden Eagle on the Northern Lights trip. And this is actually a embroidery showing the calendar. And you'll see here, these are the months, the 12 months of the year. And this represents the Julian calendar in the local tradition in Karelia, a place where we stop in a museum that you get to see if you come on that Northern Lights trip. Well, you'll remember from Alice in Wonderland that the Hatter sings for the Queen of Hearts and his voice is so bad, she accuses him of murdering time. And old man time himself is so offended that he stops time for the Hatter. And it is perpetually always tea time, 6 p.m. for the Hatter. Time waits for the Hatter. It hasn't waited for me, folks. Time doesn't stop for us. It's about time that I stopped. Thank you for your attention this evening. Perfect. Thank you very much for that, Professor Kurtz. It was a, another wonderful presentation and it's hard to keep track of all the changes across all of these years uh, with the time and obviously it feels like time has stood still for about the last six months. So it's, it's been fascinating to see all the changes that have been, you know, historically as well. I agree. Uh, we have a couple of questions that I'm going to pose to you. So again, if anyone has any questions they'd like to send through, please do using the Q&A section and we'll get round to those shortly. One that's come through here from a, um, a lady called Deborah has asked, does the moon's elliptical path have an influence on the Earth's spin? Who was uh, that from, Natasha? That was from a lady called Deborah. Deborah. Um, the answer is yes in a small amount, Deborah. When the moon is closer to the Earth, the tides will be slightly larger. When it's further, they'll be slightly smaller. And that will change the rate at which the tidal slowing of the earth happens. But of course, the length of the month is very short compared to the time at which the earth's slowing down. And so it averages out. But if we could measure time precisely enough, we could see that wobble in the earth's time because of the moon's elliptical orbit. We can't measure time precisely enough to see that, but technically, yes, that must be there. Um, there's just one question I've that's come through here from a lady called Jane, who's just asked, have there ever been attempts to decimalize time? Yes, thank you for that question, Jane. The calendars are so complicated and there are so many of them, we can't talk about all of them. The French did that after the revolution in 1789. They had 10 months in the year, they had 10 days in the week, they had 10 hours in the day, and it didn't take with the people. And so you can pass the laws, but Governments can't actually ultimately force the people what to do if the people gather together and make an agreement not to do it. And that decimal calendar, which came at the time of the metric system, and the metric system was a great idea. The whole world uses it now, except for some bits here in England and the US. Um, they tried to metricate time and that just didn't last. 12 is a better number though. 12 hours is better than 10. <laughs> happy to stay with it. Definitely. Um, and we've got a question here from a lady called Judith who's just asked, is it possible to physically stretch time? Oh, is it possible to physically stretch time? The answer is yes in general relativity. And we know that this works and we can do it ourselves to particles. If you travel at a high speed with respect to me, I will see your clock running more slowly. If I could accelerate you in a spaceship up to nearly the speed of light, 
I send you out to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star. It would take 4.3 years at nearly the speed of light to get there. If we could turn you around, there's some acceleration problems here, but turn you around, bring you back. Say the trip took 10 years. If we make you go close enough to the speed of light, you actually would come back here only two or three weeks older if we, if we make the time right. I would be 10 years older and this will really happen. And so we can change the rate at which you go into the future. We can't go into the past. We can't stop ourselves going into the future, but we can change the rate. This happens with subatomic particles. Some of them are not stable. They have very short lifetimes, but if we speed them up to nearly the speed of light, their lives get longer and longer and longer by exactly the formula that Einstein gave us in his theory of relativity. It really does work. We're confident it would happen to us too. Good question. Yeah, very, very good question. Interesting one to come um, that way. I don't know if you've seen the other one that's come through here from um, someone called Glenn, who's just asked, why do we get a tidal bulge opposite the moon? Uh, Natasha, would you like me to do another talk? I've got one called um, Sun Dogs and Blue Moons, and it's all about tides. With pleasure, absolutely with pleasure. And we even go out to tides and planets, moons, tides and the stars, tides and galaxies. There are tides all over the place. And the answer to your question, why is there a bulge on the other side? Let me see if I can do it for you quickly. It has to do with the balance between centrifugal force and gravitational attraction. But first I need to teach you that centrifugal force in some cases is really real. And that's what that talk's all about. I gave that one on the Queen Elizabeth just before it got shut down for COVID. And I did it as the last talk at the University of Sydney um, this year before it shut for COVID. And then I quickly got on a plane and left before I got trapped in Australia. And I would be quite happy to do the Tide talk for you sometime. Oh, well, that would be that would be perfect. We would obviously really appreciate that. And obviously, we've got many fans of you here, so I'm sure they'll join us for it if, um, if you're able to do that for us. Obviously, once you've completed your move to South Africa and you've settled in, um, and then we can we could hopefully see you back again in the next few months. So thank you everyone for for all of your comments, all of your questions that you've sent through to us. I'm really glad that you've enjoyed it. And thank you again to Professor Kurtz for, for delivering today's presentation.